In the spirit of reconciliation, the Theatre Thoughts podcast acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all traditional custodians of the land on which our episodes are recorded. We had to do the show with three people instead of four. So that she was playing, there was a pair of chickens <laughs> and she was playing one of the chickens. Uh, so one of the chickens just came on and was going, bark, bark, hello, where are you, Helen? And, and then one of us was doing the lines behind the curtain going, <laughs> going I'm just I'm just in getting dressed I'll see you soon so we were having to do everything with this sort of mystery chicken in, in the, the background mystery chicken. you're listening to the theater thoughts podcast where we dive deep into the world of theater and celebrate the magic of the stage I'm your host Justin Clark and I'm here to guide you through insightful conversations behind the scenes stories and thought-provoking discussions about everything theatre related. Before we dive into today's episode, I want to remind you to connect with us on social media. You can follow us on Instagram at theatrethoughtsaus and ttpod underscore official for updates, behind the scenes content and exclusive interviews. You can also find us on TikTok at Theatre Thoughts Australia for even more theatre goodness. And if you'd like to support the podcast and gain access to exclusive content, consider subscribing to our Patreon. So whether you're a seasoned theatregoer or just starting your journey, please sit back, relax and enjoy this brand new episode of the Theatre Thoughts Podcast. Welcome everyone to a brand new episode of the Theatre Thoughts Podcast. We are going all the way over to the UK today to talk with a comedian improviser and creator of Improv Your Life. She's also the assistant artistic director for Showstoppers, the improvised musical, regularly appeared in shows such as Drunk History, The Now Show and Josh Howey's Losing It and has been awarded as Best Newcomer nominee and Best Musical Act and reviewed as little less than a comic genius by The Telegraph. Please welcome Pippa Evans to the podcast. Oh, hello. Welcome to me. (laughs) Thank you so much for jumping on for a chat. There's nothing I would rather do at nine o'clock on a Sunday morning, Justin, than hang out with you. Thank you so much. It means a lot. It's a, it's, a, it's a late night here and then early night there, so I really appreciate you jumping on for a chat. So you're on to talk about Showstoppers. Now, Showstoppers is, for those who don't know, an improvised musical. And I remember the very first time I saw it in the UK, I had to come and see it because I was like, how the hell do you do an improvised musical? And... Uh, Let's just say when I saw it, I the answer was very much laid out in front of me and it was pure genius, to be honest. Wow. So when when did you see it? How long ago was that? Oh, that would have been in like oh, probably 2016 or 17. It was a while ago. Wow. Okay, so that would have been just after we'd done our West End run and been awarded the Olivier Award. So Ooh. that's a shiny award that we're very proud of. And in fact, we're the first and still the only improv uh, theatre show to have won an Olivier Award, um, which is a big deal for improv land because improvisation is so often seen as um, a silly little thing that you do at university. Um, and so we're really like, yeah, we won, the, we, we did it. We showed you that it can be really good, actually. Improvisation doesn't have to be in a room above a pub. You know, there can be quality. Exactly, exactly. That's so true. And like, like I said, when I saw it, it was so well laid out and so cleverly done. And I, I actually, I still have to this day the intermission song in my head. I remember what the show was called for, for that night. It was called Love in Aisle 5. So it was set at a supermarket um, and uh, it was a love story uh, it was set in a supermarket. And the intermission song... I believe it went something like, um, oh, excuse my bad singing here, something like um, cleaning up, cleaning up on our five. And it was just like, <laughs> it just went like that. <laughs> and we all left at intermission singing, cleaning up, cleaning up. <laughs> it was great. That's so funny that you remember it. And, um, and what's really, so I was talking to a producer the other day and they said, don't you get really upset that that um, it's just gone, it's disappeared, the show. You know, you do one show and then it's never to be seen again. But so often, whoever's seen the show 
remembers bits of it. And so often showstoppers will be like, you'll, you'll be like walking along the road and someone will just jump in front of you and go, I had a cup of tea on a Tuesday. <laughs> You're like, what is happening? And they're going, don't you remember from the show Tea for Two? Uh, <laughs> so people that were there really connected with that show because of course each show is made for the audience in the room. Uh, and that's what we love about it so much is that show is unique to that room and will never, uh, could only be made because of the people in that room the audience and the actors uh, and would even if you said okay tomorrow let's just do the same show again it would be impossible to do it like, it's just absolutely impossible to try and recreate the magic of one night um so that's that's what we um what we love about it and of course what is really terrifying about it as a performer and the thing you have to get used to is the fact that every night you're back at you're back with the empty page mm. and you have to say yes again tonight we promise we will make you a musical and it will be of a good quality it is a good quality as well and i i was like okay so yeah they'll do some they'll do some songs they'll they'll do some um like lyrics and make up some words but i didn't expect you to make up choreography as well that was the part that just <laughs> kind of pushed it over the edge for me i was like okay this is incredible right well so and again the show you know we've been doing this show for 15 years now um maybe even longer my maths isn't great at this time on a Sunday morning, uh, but the uh, the uh, so with the, with the first shows we did were not the choreography wasn't really there. Um, we did the little tiny bit of dance. We we got a couple of people in to help us learn a few dance moves. But learning to improvise choreography was really um, one of the the hardest skills that we had to learn. And this wonderful performer, Ali James, joined the company. Um, I can't, again, I, don't, I can't remember exactly when, but I'm going to say seven years ago. I don't know. Um, and she just brought with her this wealth of knowledge where she could work because she was a, is a choreographer and a dance and dancer. So she could put the improvisation onto the skill of choreography and then figure out what it was we needed to learn and how we could communicate to each other because all of it's about communication, right? It's all about, mm. I make an offer of an idea to some, someone and someone hears what I say or sees what's on my face and they know where I want to go narratively or character fully or musically, mm. <laughs> you know, sing a, sing a line of a song, but to be able to communicate a dance move to someone mm. is a completely different language, especially if you haven't got dance training and a lot of us in Showstopper do not have dance training <laughs> and you can definitely play spot the people with dance training. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's that one, it's that one, not that one. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> Probably not that one, but I'll tell you what they've got. They've got great comedy timing. And that's all that matters. <laughs> well, before we run too far away on the showstoppers train, I'd love to know um, and for our audiences more about you and, and your history with theatre and, and improvisation as well. So I guess if you could go into a little bit about um, yourself and a bit of your history in theatre. A performer talking about themselves. I'll see if I can manage it. Um, I uh, started off doing a lot of performing at sort of school and all, you know, as a lot of people do, you go have a, had a good night, went to a nice school where they did, they encouraged the arts and um, I did a lot of performing and I, and, uh, I would do assemblies. Sometimes I would take assembly. No way. <laughs> um, and, uh, I really enjoyed just standing in front of people and sort of telling a story or talking about something or write. And then I would write things and we would perform them or whatever. Um, because yeah, the headmistress decided she didn't want to do assembly anymore. So they would just find anyone else who would want to do it. Amazing. <laughs> and guess who would step up to the plate? <laughs> Bitfor Evans. So I always, and I loved, you know, I, I loved two things. I loved stand up comedy. Uh, I loved all of the sort of British comedians of the time, which was like Victoria Wood and Jack D and Lee Evans and uh, Billy Connolly and Joe Brand and French and Saunders. So all these sort of brilliant, funny people. I, I thought being funny was really cool. But I also loved Whose Line Is It Anyway? Oh, the amazing yes. 90s improvisation TV show, which yes. will never be beaten actually because it was so perfect and so joyful and so simple. And I don't mm. know if we would even allow a show to be that simple ever again. No. <laughs> um, um, so those were my heroes, the improvisers of Whose Lines It Anyway and the, the comedians. And so when I, was, when I left school, I did an, a stand-up comedy course and um, started doing gigs. Um, 
but I was only 18 and I didn't have anything to say uh, really of any interest. So I stopped doing stand up comedy. But part of the stand up comedy course was a day where we did improvisation, like who's nice anyway. And it was the one day where I really felt like oh. I've, I've arrived. Hello. Um, and so the and the the guy teaching the class was like, oh, you've really got a you've really got something there. I think you should really think about that. Which, of course, at the time, with my little insecure 18-year-old brain, I went, uh, oh, it means he thinks I'm not funny enough. Oh, no, kind of he doesn't like me. What he was saying was, <laughs> you know what I mean? He was, exactly, they don't like me. But actually, what he was saying was, look, here's here's a thing where you blossom. Mm. Um, so so that sort of started that journey. So then I sort of went into, I, did, I went to university and did drama, and then I sort of did a bit of acting. I found myself in, um, going around Italy in a, in a show teaching English to kids where I played a donkey called, um, what was my name, Gregory? Something like that. <laughs> and um, a sheep called Mr. White who, who rapped. I mean, amazing. We're, it, really, it, was, <laughs> it was amazing for all the right, wrong reasons. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but we learned so much, right? It's so nothing, nothing better than being just in a van, four girls in a mm. van, driving around Italy, eating pizza, what a dream. Putting on a slightly terrible show. <laughs> uh, I was, oh, it was just amazing. I loved it so much. Uh, and I, whenever young actors ask me for advice, I always say, find one of those jobs because they're, they are really fun. You learn way more doing a show like that than you will if you go straight to the national. Mm. Like, sure, who doesn't want to go straight to the oh, national? Of course, wouldn't but mind it. You will learn... <laughs> Far more turning up to a a, vill- a random village in Italy, having to ask directions to the school, trying to learn a completely different language, having to put up your set in like the corner of a hall, um, and then and then packing it all down and going off again. One of my favourite mo- memories of that was one of the girls got food poisoning, <gasps> and so the next day oh, she no. couldn't do the show. So we had to uh... <laughs> we. <laughs> We had to do the show with three people instead of four. So that she was playing, there was a pair of chickens <laughs> and she was playing one of the chickens. Uh, so one of the chickens just came on and was going, bark, bark, hello, where are you, Helen? And, and then one of us was doing the lines behind the curtain going, <laughs> going I'm just, I'm just in getting dressed. I'll see you soon. <laughs> so we were having to do everything with this sort of mystery chicken in, in the, the background. Mystery chicken. But anyway. <laughs> Uh, mystery chicken so so uh, so yeah, I, was, I went to Italy and did that and then I found myself in a musical in Edinburgh Festival mm. uh, a brand new musical that was it wasn't great okay I'm gonna be honest Justin it wasn't a great musical <laughs> but uh, be as honest as you want I but, love it <laughs> but it was it was fun and we learned a lot and uh, that musical has never been seen again yeah for the and right in fact, reasons, the person who probably. wrote that musical, <laughs> that person who wrote the musical, often sends me messages to, uh, saying, "Just would like to apologise again for that musical <laughs> I wrote." <laughs> <laughs> well, at least they knew. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, they knew, they knew, and um, also, again, great advice. I say, just get, just do a musical. It doesn't matter if it's good or bad. Actually, again, it's the point. Put, put it on, learn stuff. Um, but it meant I was like, oh, I love musicals. I love improvising. I love stand-up comedy. What do I do with all of this? And the answer is you just keep finding ways to kind of combine things. Um, And so then I started doing, I met, I met during that Edinburgh Fringe, I met an improv group who uh, needed a new person when they got back to London. So I just went and hung out with them and worked the box office for them. And then when there was a space, they were like, would you like to come and try? Okay. And I went, yeah, okay. So, so then I was suddenly in a group, and it was one of those things where you go, I can't tell you how to join an improv group because I just was in a box office, and then suddenly was on stage, mm. and then because I could do it, the door opened up. Yeah, um, and that meant I started making connections in improv land, and that's how I ended up meeting Dylan Emery, who's one of the artistic directors of Showstopper. And he said, oh, me and my friend Adam Megiddo are start, I try to work on this project with Ken Campbell, who was his big theater aficionado, like wild man um, <laughs> who loved to try different things. Uh, and he said, would you come along and see if 
you could do it because I could sing. And again, one of the things about improvising is it's one thing to make up a song and it's one thing and it's one, but it's another thing to make it sound like an actual song. Mm, so yeah. to have someone in the show who can actually sing to a, a high standard is sort of makes a huge difference. Right. So you go, Oh, suddenly me doing all those musical theater things makes sense of where I am now. But at mm. the time it felt like I was trying to do three different things, but actually I was just trying to slowly work my way in, in a spiral to find to the point where the Venn diagram was uh, meeting. Just kind of met, right in the middle, right in that sweet spot. Right in that sweet spot. And so so that's when I started doing Showstopper. And, but on the side of Showstopper, I was also doing a character called Loretta Main, who was an American singer-songwriter who I did on the circuit for 10, 12 years or something. Um, and I actually went to the Melbourne Comedy Festival with a show. Oh, amazing. Uh, called um, Bi Bipolar. Um it's about two polar bears, guys. That's, <laughs> that's my level Bipolar. of comedy. And... <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> See what she did? Oh, my goodness. Why is she not a huge star over there? <laughs> um, but, yeah, so I did I did Loretta Main on the gala, perform the Melbourne, the comedy gala show. So that's one of my best quality TV clips, actually, is, yeah. is me doing that. And um, you kind of can't... S Again, you you go. Oh, is that? Oh, that was you because it's such a different little kind of corner of what I do. Mm. Um, but again, it was the, what I was doing there was writing songs and learning how to be on stage and deliver jokes and how to hold your own space. So, so imp improvisation is all about holding your own space, but within the context of other people's space as well and being a unit. So, how do you? be the star and the chorus mm, yeah. yeah it's a really amazing skill to learn and then having this other place where it's like no you're the star here so it's actually all on your shoulders here and learning the difference between the skills you need to hold a whole space by yourself and the skills you need to be in a group um and so that's how i ended up um where i am now and now i write musicals justin do you write so I've, I've written well. a musical called now now I, I write them what's going on stop leave something for someone else <laughs> Pips. uh so i yeah i just wrote a musical called now that's what i call a musical which is based on the now albums do, do you have them in australia do you have those in australia now are they the ones that like the compilation albums that are like this is that's it yeah that's i think it. we had them um, uh it was called so fresh is what we called them so it was like so fresh 90s so fresh thousands oh wow well, so yeah, the the now albums in the UK were were like the the present, and yeah. they're still very much actually they still they're still one of the few sort of CDs that really sells. Yeah, right. Um, and they are all compilations, and everyone everyone will get them at Christmas. You get that would be what you'd buy of the year, so you get all the, the top songs of the year, whatever. So anyway, so so it's a, a so it's a jukebox musical uh, using songs from the eighties, and I'm super excited for it to be a real thing. That's so, so cool. So yeah, so I I do musical musical theatre. Made make it up, write it down. Make it up, write it down. That's so cool. I think that's a great idea for a musical. The nineties, the oh, sorry eighties, eighties compilation with the nows and so. Ah, I could, I'm picturing it in my mind. I could see it happening. It's gonna be a blast. You're gonna have to come over just to see it, Justin. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to book a trip. <laughs> If you listen to music online, I'm sure you have the same issue most of us face. The online music services have gotten out of control. They're overstuffed, a bit convoluted, and it's often hard to find what you really want. But there's a solution, AccuRadio.com. It's a really unique brand of online radio that I know you're going to love. Not only is the website easy to use to discover new content, but in addition to the standard music you'd expect to find, they also have an amazing collection of Broadway and theater-adjacent music. From cast albums to collections grouped by decade or even Broadway-related artists, all their channels are curated by a real person, so you know they're going to be good. The best part of it all? It's 100% free. So if you're looking for better music for your workday, give AccuRadio a try. That's A-C-C-U-Radio.com. AccuRadio. Well, I'd love to ask you um, our one-minute theatre thoughts questions, if you're open for it. They're just kind of off-the-cuff sort of questions and see what kind of comes to your mind. Go for it. All right, here we go. So I'd love to know, what has been your favourite production that you've seen recently? Well, do you know what, Justin? I was in, so I live in Edinburgh in Scotland. Um, 
so I don't, uh, I, so I, but I was down in the London town uh, recently for work and I saw Operation Mincemeat uh, in London's glittering West End. Oh, yes. And it is absolutely fantastic. Like, it's just such a brilliant musical. It's really funny. I mean, it's about, about a, <laughs> literally a, a dead body being used. Um, as a decoy during World War II. So it's quite a serious subject. Um, yeah. But they do such a great job of telling the story where it's really, it's about the characters and their relationships. Um, and it's, it's, and they play, they all play about 7 million different characters. The dance routines are incredible. I mean, you're exhausted Amazing. just watching it in the interval. You go, how are they doing? How are they managing to do that? It's got kind of showstopper vibes in the fact that yeah. they're so playful and, oh. um, you know, they put on a hat and they're someone else and then they put on another hat and they're someone else. Um, and the production values are, are just brilliant. And it just feels really British um like a real really british yeah, right. musical and that's really nice to watch something and go oh that feels like that's that that we made that and it's not been made to hopefully go you know all around the world it's like this is yeah this is uh, this has been made for the uk and if any if anyone else wants it that's great too but um but uh, yeah, yeah it's definitely a but british sense of like humor for us <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I'd love to know, uh, what's the most rewarding experience you've had in your career? Ooh, the most rewarding? Um, yes. Do you know what? Actually, I've, I do quite a lot of teaching um, improvisation, and that has been fantastic. So, so I teach this. So I wrote a book called Improv Your Life, and I teach a course about it. And it's just about, about using improvisation to help you get get more out of the day to day and mm. so often i get messages from people saying your course changed my life your books changed my life oh wow and um and that's really sort of wonderful to know that some somebody's been helped by by a thing that you believe in you know that you go i think i think this mm. is helpful is this helpful and someone goes yes that that is helpful so teach, yeah, teaching improvisation, oh, so particularly as a life skill, is mwah, delicious. Love that. That's so lovely. That's so wholesome. I love that. Um, I would love to know then, what is your all-time favourite production or do you have one? What do you, what do you mean all-time favourite? You mean thing that I saw that I thought was the best? Yeah, or it could be like, you know, like I saw Lion King when I was like 10 years old and it's the best thing I've ever seen or I always think about oh, this see, or yeah. this one holds us, yeah. Um, I'm really, I'm sort of, I, I find that, impossible to say because i'm like pick a mix you know i like love pick a mix so i love lots of bits of other mm. things so i would say oh well i saw something rotten in new york oh, on yes. broadway and that was so exciting and amazing and brilliant uh, but also i saw fun home and that was so brilliant and amazing so mm. uh oh, and then i saw this and it was so brilliant and amazing um, yeah. So I don't. Yeah. But but I suppose my first theatre experience was seeing Joseph and his Technicolor dream coat. Oh, of course, Philip. it's a staple it's for uh, that's the a UK. staple. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that was um, that's probably stayed with me for ever. But I could, yeah, I could, I would be lying if I said I had one favorite production because I I am that person who would then say, oh, but oh. Oh no, but that was my favorite. I'm a fickle monster. Well, and you know, when you do pick and mix, that's the best thing. You like things that come and go and some stay, some move on. That's right. <laughs> well, then last question for the Theatre Thoughts questions was, um, which production would you most want to see come to the West End? Mm. Well, one of them has already just arrived, which is Hades Town. Um, <gasps> oh, we are which so is jealous. Absolutely. So brilliant. I saw it at the National when they were trying it out a few years ago. Mm. And I just thought it was so good. So, so good. And um, so I'm really glad that's arrived. And then Something Rotten, actually. I would love to see that in the West End. I'm surprised that hasn't come to the, the West End. Musicals. I'm very surprised that hasn't come. Because yeah, it's got too. West End written all over it. Absolutely. It's really joyful. It's really funny. Um, and it's, I guess, again, it's quite British humour, you know. Mm. So uh, I think it would do really, really, really well. 
uh, I just love that song, Hard to Be the Bard. I yes. It's one of the funniest songs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and also the song, it's a musical, the, uh, the whole explanation of musicals. Yeah. I think incredible. It's so good. It's right up there with like my sense of humor, I think. Like I, I haven't seen it. Mm. I had to I had to do one of the bootleg versions because I was dying to watch it. And um and it was just so funny. And Shakespeare is like my dream role to do. Like if I was ever to do a musical and audition for it, it'd be like that's the role I want. That's the part you want to play. Yeah. That's um it's a great, a really great part, isn't it? Oh, he's so funny. It's just great. Oh, excellent. Well, thank you so much for answering those. So um, what we'll do, we'll get back onto Showstoppers then because you kind of touched on where you started with Showstoppers and where it sort of started. But I'd love to know what's um, kind of laid out for audiences who haven't seen it yet. So um, what's like kind of the rundown for how to make this such a successful show? So it's an improvised musical and it does exactly what it says on the tin. So yes. we are making up an entire West End level musical for the audience for one night only. So the audience comes in, you sit down, you go, oh gosh, what's it going to be? And we have a host character who's the writer. The, the, so the premise is that he's a writer of a musical. Um, and uh, it usually we have two main writers, Dylan Emery and Sean McCann. I sometimes do it as well and uh, Andrew Pugsley sometimes does it Adam Megiddo sometimes does it but they are our main guys and they you come out and, and they go um, one of them will say, say oh the phone rings and it's the producer the producer says I've got a theatre have you got a musical and he says yes so he's just bullshitting <laughs> uh, to go yeah 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 give me the space give me the space hangs up hangs up the phone and then goes oh my gosh you have to help me now write a musical um, and so then he gets from the audience the title the setting and three or four musical styles so the audience gets a sort of a flavor of music from different musicals they might already want to see people often say things like Sondheim Rodgers and Hammerstein um Mamma Mia has been coming up a lot recently oh, okay. Hamilton things like that yeah so we'll do um so so some of the songs will be in the style of other musicals and we and we pay homage to them rather than um take the piss right out of them yeah uh so the yeah the vibe is that we are going to put on a great musical we like to think of ourselves as a group of clowns who really believe they're about to improvise the next lame is okay <laughs> so uh so we treat it with that kind of um importance but of course the settings are often quite ridiculous mm. um like you said you saw the one that's set in a supermarket that's not, you know, that of course they're super. Um, in fact, the the new steps um, Duke's bo- jukebox musical is set in a supermarket, I believe. Oh, so right. it's not a place that you can't have a musical. Yeah. But a little unusual. Yeah. So we, so we do often do supermarkets, IKEA, um, pirate ships, um, Poundland. I don't know if you have Poundland oh, in yep. Australia. Probably yep. Dollar World or something yeah. like that. Um, <laughs> You know, places places like that. So, and sometimes they're historical settings, and sometimes they're mystical settings. Incredible. And so, we literally then just come on stage and make up a musical. So, yeah. I, it's quite it's one of those shows that I think you, you do end up saying quite a lot. If you ha- you have to go and see it to believe it, because yeah, definitely, it can sound a bit rubbish. In fact, I think some of our West End reviews started with, "I was really prepared to hate this." <laughs> 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 I was fully prepared because they just like what well, it's just I was fully prepared to not enjoy this and I, I I totally understand that of course and especially with the West End ticket price you know gosh mm. am I pay, I'm gonna pay 40 50 pounds for something that doesn't even exist yeah yeah so we often liken it to football or a sport you know we go we've done all the training we spend a lot of time workshopping ourselves learning skills and then we just putting those skills onto the pitch because exactly. you never know what's going to happen because you, you never know what the other team's going to bring, the audience being the other team. The audience gives us some stuff and off we, off we run. And then the host character keeps going back to the audience mm. to keep us on our toes. Right. To show, to, to, to show the audience that we are making it up. Yeah. Because, of course, there's also pre-planned. lots of conspiracy theories. Everybody thinks it's pre-planned or they will think we have earpieces or uh, yeah. we've got... Um, for a while, we had a clock right on the front of the stage, a little, just a little 
clock from um, the early learning centre, which is where you buy things for kids. It was a, yeah. a clock just so we could read it, you know, and it was there. But it was sort of rectangular like that. And um, an audience member thought that it was an auto cue and that oh. we, was, we were all just reading this auto cue. Yeah, right. It's, kind of, that is, it's much harder to just all focus on an auto cue mm. and That'd to be get so our minds than it is to just make it up, right? And also, someone is still having to make it up. Exactly. Like, imagine someone's sitting there typing all the lines so, and being like, you know, as they're going, and then you're, that's even more impressive. <laughs> we, we had a review once that had to be re- redacted because it was, uh, it said we clearly had just one script. Uh, I think it was set in Jurassic Park, the one they reviewed. Um, and they said, clearly they've got one script and they just insert the word dinosaur to change oh, it oh come on <laughs> but but it was so weird right because you're like it was we were, we were playing dinosaurs we were homaging the film we were it was just so weird to go that's, how could that in any way yeah. have been anything else other than jurassic park the musical that's so strange but anyway is there any that um have like shocked you or like stood out to you or like uh there's been a moment on stage where you got like a a choice from the audience that you were like, what the F is that choice? And we're going to run with it. You know, something like that stood out. Oh, oh, oh yeah. I mean, loads. We did an amazing show. Oh, God. Someone asked God. for it to be set in their mother's head. <laughs> what's that mean? Well, what's that mean? And um, so we did So we did this show and, and it was, so the show is generally, it, it's billed as a family yeah. Um, yeah. comedy entertainment show. That's what it's billed as. But occasionally what happens is the show is very, very beautiful, um, which is these are what we call like the golden shows where they manage to be really funny and entertaining, mm. but also really beautiful. And so this show started off quite funny um, and it was just sort of memories inside this this woman's head. So a guy going to visit his mum and um, she's sort of recounting things and then we were acting them out. And then all these memories started coming up about um, things that happened in her life that were slightly darker. And and then it all sort of transpired that actually oh. she was in a coma and she wasn't talking to anybody. And oh, we were wow. just her thoughts as she was sort yeah. of departing from this land. And, and but so we were on stage going, is this okay? <laughs> it seems quite serious. <laughs> Are we making you cry? <laughs> yeah, and it was real. And by and the end, we were all crying because it was so beautiful. Oh. And um, uh, so that was that was really wonderful. So that's really lovely when things like that happen. But the guy and the person who said sat inside my mum's head, their mum was actually suffering, I think, from Alzheimer's. Oh and, wow! And so we had somehow sort of channeled the idea that that we were exploring thoughts that couldn't actually couldn't actually escape amazing wow um, that's so, so that, was, that, that was is beautiful pretty, isn't it yeah really beautiful and there's been a, you know been a couple of shows like that um but then other things like that once we were on stage and uh, it was this was during the edinburgh fringe and were we i think i was an emperor or something it was me and ruth brant i think Memories are weird, aren't they? Because yeah. I always, I always yeah. fear that I'll name people and then one of the showstoppers will call me up and go, "That wasn't Ruth. That, that was, was me." me. <laughs> you, know, uh, you go, "Sorry, sorry." Um, but the yeah, that's right. We were all, we were like sat on a, on stage, you know, with the lights and everything. And then I think we were in yeah, we were in ancient Rome, and suddenly all the lights switched. Because there was a power cut. Oh, wow. And the emergency lighting came on. So suddenly we were not lit, but the audience was lit by the emergency lighting. Oh, right. And so we just carried on. Um, and suddenly, but but, there, but now we, we just involved the whole audience as the audience at the Coliseum. Yeah. Ba- baying for blood. Ah, oh, And so right. then the audience started pl- playing their role. Yeah. So it became really like interactive theatre. Wow. And then maybe a minute later, the lights switched back again. So things like that are great. When things like things like that happen, what's lovely about our production is we can just roll with it. Mm, Whereas, yeah. of course, if you're in a, a big shiny, shiny show with very specific direction and everything, you that would stop the show yeah the show yeah, would stop. You, yeah you get somebody come on it's big very sh- hard show stop, to show stop, stop the show yeah well i mean it's called show yeah you know, show stoppers but it's, you don't actually ever stop essentially <laughs> can't stop the show even when um when lockdown happened we were just about to go on in the west end um and 
I think it was 6.30 or 6 o'clock, they, they announced, no, we're closing all the theatres. <gasps> this is it. We're not, people can't come in to see the show. Yeah. Um, and I said, well, we should just live stream the show because yeah. we can. Yeah. So can we stay in the theatre and live stream it? And so one, uh, a couple of the guys just got their phones and um, live streamed it on, uh, I can't remember, Instagram or oh, Facebook wow. or something. And of course, the other shows couldn't do that because of, of copyright and yeah. legal things. So we were, That's we were able to actually continue to improvise a show. That's so quick thinking. Wow. wow. How incredible. Well done. Amazing. Well, Pippa, I know we're coming to the end of our time together. So thank you so much for sitting to chat with me about Showstopper and, and the improvised musical and every single element. It's been great having a bit more insight because obviously, like I said, I've seen a couple of times. So getting a bit of insight for my benefit as well as the audience's is beautiful. And I'm very excited for you guys to bring it back. Mm. Yeah, we just um, oh, we just love it. So um, hopefully we'll be around for a good few more years. Well, the beautiful thing that, that I was, as you were talking, like, um, you know, with all these new shows and new genres and new songs and new artists and all this stuff, it's like you, you're never going to run out of ideas, which is great for you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, musical theatre is, I think, in a really exciting place at the moment where we're getting lots of, of new shows coming out, lots of different shows about really interesting topics, like Standing at the Sky's Edge has just opened in the West End here. Um and it's such a beautiful musical about a housing estate in Sheffield. Oh, wow. I mean, again, you wouldn't have thought that 30 years ago. We thought that would be a brilliant topic for a, a musical. Um, and uh, I really recommend listening to that, actually, because the music is just delicious. All right. I'll so, yeah, that. we're excited about the future of musical theatre. Amazing. Well, I mean, we're always jealous down here that, you know, you go to go to the West End and you just see the amazing shows you have. So we're very, I'm very jealous, and I'm sure a lot of people in Australia are very jealous of you guys. But congratulations on all the success, and I'm keen to see what comes next for you guys. Thanks, Justin. It's been a lovely chatting to you. Thank you to Pippa Evans all the way from the UK joining us on this week's episode. You can book tickets to the Olivier award-winning production of Showstopper the Musical by heading to showstopperthemusical.com. Showstopper has a residency in London and will be embarking on a national tour this year. Follow the link in this episode's description for more information. This episode was produced by Echidna Audio. Follow them on Instagram at Echidna Audio for all their audio services. Once again, if you enjoyed our podcast, leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts and head to the link in this episode's description for our Instagram account, TikTok, YouTube and Patreon. My name's Justin Clark and I'll see you next time here on the Theatre Thoughts Podcast. If you love Broadway gossip, you are not going to want to miss any episode of this podcast, Singular Sensation, The Triumph of Broadway. Plenty of dramas unfold on stage, but the best dramas unfold backstage. And there were no bigger dramas than behind the scenes of Sunset Boulevard. So you were being crucified over here, but yeah. not there. No, no, because I was turning in a performance that would get standing ovations. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> so check out my podcast, Singular Sensation, for all the juicy details of Sunset Boulevard.